All right, we're going to continue with our first exercise found under unit modules in unit two. And you'll see in the course outline, remember we're always following our course outline. I'll pull that up quick. And the course outline is right on the home page. I ask you to print it out, to download it. It's a PDF, so you can refer to it even when you're offline. But you'll see right in the course outline, it tells you what unit we're working on under unit modules. So this is unit two. Next class, after our Labor Day holiday, we'll be working on unit three. So exercise one, what we're working on is due next class. And in Canvas, it's due by midnight next class, but we're not gonna be working on it all of next class. We're gonna be working on it in the beginning of next class, hopefully turning it in, and then starting to work on our next exercise. Because remember, it's a lab class. You're meant to be really active in it, trying to learn the stuff. And with these exercises, they do not need to be perfect. You just need to be introduced to the basics. All right, so exercise one. Let's look at some of these examples really quickly. What is this based on? So compositing is a digital way of collaging images. And collage is something we're pretty familiar with because we've probably done it in elementary school and high school or just for different personal projects over the years. But collage is actually something that's barely 100 years old. It was something that was invented in modernist art movements in the early 20th century, especially art movements that happened right around the world wars, especially World War I. So one of those early artists was Picasso who did what's called synthetic cubism, where he actually collaged his, his abstractions out of materials, like newspaper, magazines, the, the labels from uh, a lot of liquor bottles. Picasso always had plenty of liquor bottles. Not an admirable man, but a very influential artist, right? It wasn't until really during World War II and the run-up to World War II that you had photographs being used as collage material. And the first name that was given was photo montage, right? And some of those really important artists were Hannah Huck in Germany, Jess Collins, Jesse Treese. Jesse Treese is a modern example. So I'll give you some historical examples, like the very first, some of the very first, along with John Hartfeld and others, to collage with photographs, often doing very critical work of the, the Weimar Republic that allowed the National Socialist Party, the Nazi Party, to come to power. So these are pretty important pieces in art history. They were, as many modernist artists, were very critical of the rise of fascism across Europe. We have Jess Collins in the 60s and 70s for kind of the counterculture. And Jess Collins would composite with photographs, but use them almost like brush strokes. And then you have Jesse Treese. With contemporary artists, I often just use their Instagram pages, right? Who, in a contemporary setting, uses photo collage, traditional photo collage. And we'll call them hand cut collage because it's easy to mistake them for digital composites, right, to make their work. And sometimes it's surreal, sometimes it's narrative. And you can see, especially with the contemporary examples, how collage is very similar to digital compositing. Now, digital compositing is all about doing that with digital files, instead of having to use glue and scissors and X-Acto knives. Now, my favorite fine artist that does an example of the line art jumble is the artist Arturo Herrera, who has exhibited in San Antonio through Art Pace and Ruby City, but largely has had a history working in Chicago. Now, what's great about Arturo Herrera's work is most of it is very much based on other people's images. And the first show I saw of his work was in the 90s, and it was all work based on Disney coloring books. Now, why Disney was so interesting as a choice 
was because Disney is famously the most litigious company on the planet that sues artists and creators and just average person all the time for infringing on their intellectual property, right? So here's an example, you know, of using something from Disney. But Arturo Herrera somehow has never, uh, I'll never say never been sued by Disney because I don't know that, but has never lost a suit <laughs> publicly. Has always been able to defend his work as being fully transformative and original, even though it, it takes from a lot of different sources. So some of my favorite work was that early work. So if I zoom in here, you can see this piece I love by Arturo Herrera. And it was in the Armory show in LA that I saw in the late 90s. And it's actually, if I remember correctly, it's all cut out of colored felt and then hung on a wall. So this piece is actually like 17 feet tall. If not this exact piece, the one I saw was very similar to it. And you can tell what it is from it if you know the source material. So if you know Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, which was Disney's first feature film from the 1930s, it was the first feature animated film ever made, extremely influential, you can kind of recognize this line art. But what you can't recognize is a copyrightable character, right? You can't see the face of one of the dwarves, for instance. So he is being very selective with which parts of these coloring books he uses as inspiration for his artworks. And even though this isn't a digital collage, it is a compositing of that line art in order to inform the artwork. This is another one. This one, you see Snow White, right? But instead of a recognizable face, character design, silhouette, he overlaps it with this abstract expressionist kind of shape of drips. So he's subverting the content, turning it into his own thing. And then from some past students, uh, this is artwork by Angela Wally, who was one of my first students in the Alamo Colleges District. And with her partner, Mark Wally, they have a band that's called Dreamboard, and they used this technique to create their t-shirts, right? And their promotional materials for their first album. And if you want to check out Dreamboard in San Antonio, they play every once in a while. They're working on their second album. They're pretty good. They're also really great um, documentary filmmakers under Wally Films. So all of those, do you kind of see how those are using the skill set that we're going to practice here? compositing, but not compositing vast amounts of information, just compositing lines, being really discreet about it. Now, the goal is to make it unique and engaging in order to look a little bit more like some of these past examples, to really stand out on its own. So to do that, I need to use a program instead of glue and paper and scissors I need to use what's called a raster imaging program. And the one we're going to use just for this exercise before we get into using Photoshop for the semester is called Photopea. So we're at that stage now. If we've gotten our references, and we have, and we have them in our folder under exercise one, and we have at least five of them, but you can do as many as 10 and still probably have time to do the project. Now that you have those, we need to open those files up using this website. And it's just photop.com. So you don't need to rely on the link to get to it. You can just type in photop.com. You can log into it if you want to. Um, if you log into it, it will remember your progress. You know, each time you log in and out from different computers. But we're not going to rely on any kind of cloud storage for this, especially not a free website storage. So we're always going to download our work <laughs> and save it onto our computer. And then best practice is to also save it onto our drive. So if you don't yet have a thumb drive, it's good to have one by next week. Oh, not a thumb. That was one we can borrow. Nope, I don't, have one. I don't have one you can borrow. But this will be good for you to back up your work. Remember, you'll always save it on these computers. It's pretty safe on this, these computers, but you always want to back it up in two places. Yep. 
That'll work. Yep. All right. So how do we do PhotoP? I've opened up PhotoP.com. Basically, what I need to do is open a, a file. So I'm going to take the, the file. There's a few ways to do that. I can drag the file onto here to automatically open it. I can click on Open from Computer. And that's probably the easiest thing. I can also go to File, Open. So I'm going to say File, Open. And then I have to find my, my images. So I know they're on the desktop. And then I know they're in my folder. So I'm going to open up my folder, open up my Exercise 1 folder. And what is my favorite image here? I think my favorite image here is this one. So I'm going to open that one first. Okay, so I'm going to pause. Okay, this project is all about digital image mining. So we want to keep high quality reference and keep it in high quality as we turn it into a diamond, right? As we turn it into what we want. In order for it to be high quality, we need to understand its resolution and its size. So now, once your favorite file is open in PhotoP, what you want to do is go to image, and image size just to see that information. And this is very similar to what Google gives you. It tells you how many pixels by how many pixels under width and height. You see that's in pixels. And it will give you something that it calls DPI, which is a really bad idea because DPI is what printers use. That's called dots per inch. But they don't mean dots per inch. They mean pixels per inch, which is actually PPI. So this is 300 pixels per inch, this image. It's 2,000 by, by 22, you know, it's big. What we want to do, according to the directions, which we can always refer to, is we want to create a file that is 8 inches by 10 inches. And we want it to be 300 pixels per inch. And I thought I had that in there, but let me make sure. Well, I won't mess with that right now. But we want every assignment and exercise we turn in has to be a minimum of 8 by 10 inches by 300 pixels per inch. And actually, it's helpful if you guys repeat that because you're going to ask me a lot. So any image, what's the smallest it can be? 300 pixels per inch. By what physical dimensions? Because you need both. 8 by 10 inches is the physical size it will print. The resolution is how many pixels are in each inch, right? 300 pixels per inch. So this shows me that I have a lot of pixels, but I have no idea how that relates to an 8 by 10 piece of paper until I switch it from pixels to inches, right? And then it will show me that this image is 9 inches wide, 7 inches tall by 300 pixels per inch. So it's got the 300 pixels per inch right. I am not going to resample it. I'm not going to change it because then it would, it would mean that the computer changes my pixel quality. Instead, I am now going to go to image and something called canvas size. Canvas size is the, the grid that you can make an image on. And we are going to make this canvas size what we want. So I'm going to go to inches. And I'm actually going to make this eight inches wide and its height I'm going to make 10 inches and then I'm going to say okay and it's okay if it crops off your image a little bit your image is still there it's just some of it might be off of the frame it depends what the resolution is so yeah, don't worry yet. Your image is still there. Next, we're going to go to image size again. And now we have an image that's 8 by 10, but you might not be at 300 pixels per inch. Does that make sense? So now you're going to make that 300 pixels per inch. You're going to type in 300 and say OK. So that is called setting up your working space. Okay, I'm going to come around and help you guys do that. But before I do that, I'm going to do what I recommend you all do. You're going to say file, save as PSD. That will save this file as a PSD file to your desktop. And you're going to name it like we're going to name all of our files. 
with your name.